Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bruce Dutu. I'll wait till folks, uh, there's a few folks in the back coming in. Please have a seat. So I'm Bruce Dutu, and I'm the chair of Native American Studies here at Dartmouth. And it is a great pleasure to uh, see you all here on such a beautiful day. So thank you for making time uh, when so many folks are just out on the green and just, uh, you know, just saying, well, I know there's good stuff going on, but I'll stay on the green. Uh, so thank you for making time to join us today. Um, this event uh, is co-sponsored by our program, Native American Studies and the Dickey Center, and in particular, the Institute for Arctic Studies. So Ross Virginia, my colleague uh, in the back there, and I uh, sort of work through this and uh, are, are very, very delighted to have Dan back on our campus. Um, after Dan's presentation, uh, he will be uh, taking uh, any of your questions that you have. So if you can hold them until after his presentation, that would be much appreciated. Uh, the person who will do the introduction um, is one of our current undergraduate students, Makakwa Jones, uh, who is a transfer student from Haskell uh, uh, Nations uh, University and is in her first year with us as a Dartmouth student and already has made quite the plunge in terms of involvement in uh, our program, in the lives of Native students through the Native American program. She's taken a leadership role in reconceiving a, a research program called Occam Scholars here at the college, and just basically has made the kind of splash that we all thought she would when we first met her last uh, winter up in Alaska at a conference. And uh, so it's a great, great pleasure to welcome Makakwa to the podium to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Kwa Jones. Um, so I transferred here in August, and I transferred from Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. And Dr. Wildcat was my academic advisor. And he was the one who originally encouraged me to apply to Dartmouth when I got on the planning committee for an Iger, a Fort Iger conference in Alaska. And I didn't want to, but he kept pushing me and kept pushing me and, until finally I did, and, and I got in, and I'm, and I'm happy to be here. But so, um, so for the past three years, I've studied under Dr. Wildcat at Haskell, and his internship program that he leads there kind of really changed my life. It introduced me to my research that I'm going to be doing my senior thesis on. So um, Dr. Wildcat is a Yuchi member of the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma. He's been a faculty member for the American Indian Studies Department at Haskell Indian Nations University for the past 26 years. He's now the acting dean of the college of natural and social sciences for the past two years. He has three books that he's published. Um, the first one is Power in Place, Indian Education in America, with his friend and mentor, and I think a lot of American Indian Studies students mentor, Vine Deloria Jr. Um, Vine Deloria was the founder of the first PhD, the first American Indian Studies PhD program at the University of Arizona. He was also um, authored a book called Destroying Dogma, Vine Deloria Jr.'s Vine Deloria Jr. and his influence on American society with Steve Pavlik, who's a professor at Northwest Indian College in Washington. And his latest book, Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge, has gotten quite a lot of attention in looking at um, indigenous peoples for sust sustainability solutions in dealing with climate change. So for the past seven years, he has been deeply involved in climate change research in indigenous communities and activities including serving as the convener for the American Indian Alaska Native Climate Change Working Group. I think a lot of students who take on climate change issues kind of get bogged down with this um, kind of depressing nature that we see going on, and especially with the rhetoric going on about climate change. And one of the things that I love about the working group that Dan leads um, is that you get to meet a lot of other students, a lot of undergraduate students who are actually doing things and, and very positive and optimistic in what they're doing in their own communities and how they're kind of attacking these issues with this you know, attitude like you know, that they're gonna make a difference. And so it's kind of an uplifting um, area in climate change research where you can actually go and feel better about it because you know people around you are just as passionate and working just as hard as you are, so it makes you feel not so alone. And Dan convenes that every spring and fall, and so I encourage anybody here who's interested in attending that to do that. So um, uh, without further ado, here's Dr. Wackett.
I guess, uh, uh, Abigail, thank you very much. And uh, uh, again, many thanks to, uh, uh, you know, Bruce and, and Ross and everyone who made this, uh, this visit possible. Um, it really is an honor to be here. Um, I think there's a tremendous potential for uh, some really fruitful collaboration between the 37 tribal colleges and universities in the United States and Canada and Dartmouth uh, University because of your strong Native American Studies program and uh, the Dickey Center and, and the Arctic Research Center. So I'm really uh, here as an ambassador to kind of see what I can stir up, maybe some exciting collaborations and uh, joint partnerships that we can get underway. So. Um, Anyway, bear with me, I'm going to read this 50-page paper. No, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, and I, I, sorry if any of you are disappointed with the absence of a PowerPoint, but I'm not uh, really a, a PowerPoint kind of guy, and uh, I don't have those skills to put the proper audio visuals in them and make them interesting and, and exciting. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm afraid I do harbor a prejudice, much like my mentor, Vine Deloria Jr., who was of the opinion, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, that there's, you know, two problems with PowerPoints. Usually the people presenting them have no power, and secondly, you know, the presentations often make no point. And so I think, you know, so consider yourself, you know, basically saved from death by PowerPoint, because if you had to read all of my bullets, those bullets would actually kill you by the time you were, you were done with this. So, um, you know, and, and to get started, I, I guess, you know, I have to make one observation and, and uh, two sort of disclaimers or, uh, yeah, I guess they're disclaimers or disclosure statements. And the first one is, um, I've, I've thought about this a lot because um, uh, um, some of my friends at NOAA, we were, we, uh, this working group I meet with uh, regularly, twice a year and in a, or constantly in, in interaction throughout the year working on uh, undergrad undergraduate research projects on native lands, um, we're, we're constantly, you know, comparing notes and everything. And, and um, I'm blocking on the name, I'll remember here in a, in a second, but one of my colleagues at NOAA got up here and said, you know, I've, I think I've discovered the problem. The problem is this, the world has problems, but colleges and universities have departments. <laughs> now, when you think about it, that's very insightful. And I think what we're coming to today is the realization that given the scale of problems we're facing, whether those be environmental, whether they be global climate change, whether they be you know, economic, institutional issues, education issues, uh, all of these issues, when, you, when we think about it you know, deeply today, we recognize they are indeed very complex problems. And that I think one of the things that we will have to encourage is you know the opportunity to have really you know interdisciplinary multidisciplinary teams that are able to communicate to each other and talk fairly competently and coherently and in a shared language so that we can begin to really tackle some of the most pressing issues we face in that sense i think we should look to uh, indigenous traditions in North America, the ones I'm most familiar with, this may indeed apply to other indigenous peoples around the world, but I think there is something to be uh, uh, gained from this notion that, you know, uh, knowledge, uh, while it may be convenient to fit it in disciplines, that um, sometimes that does create these sort of art of artificial kind of categorical kinds of constructions of the world that are neat for us, but may not be very good at capturing the complexity of problems we face. So I make that just, you know, that observation. Uh, that leads me to the first disclosure statement. I, I decide, I, I recognize this about 10 years ago. I finally realized that, you know, I'm really not an academic because academics have clear disciplines. And I decided, well, what am I? And I said, well, I guess I'm just a non-disciplined scholar. And, and, um, uh, I'm not going to say undisciplined because I'm afraid if I did that, that uh, probably my mot hotel room tonight would be canceled before this talk was over and I might be sent packing forthwith, you know. So no, I'm not undisciplined, I'm just non-disciplined. Or we might say today, I'm a transdisciplinary scholar. I read everything. I read, e not literally, I don't read everything, but I, I read a lot of stuff. And it doesn't fit neat disciplinary categories. 
and um, read everything, not literally and, and anything. And what I found in that is a great liberation, really a tremendous liberation, because I found out if I want to really get a sense of the nature of the ecological and, and, and environmental crisis today, the most insightful authors are poets. They are not scientists, I would argue. They are indeed poets. So I hope we have some poets in the room. Uh, we have, you have tremendous contributions to make, an artist in general, you know, uh, relative to this issue of communication of sciences. We, science, we need scientists and artists working together. That would be very interesting, and we, we desperately need that. So anyway, I'm sorry I don't fit neatly in any kind of disciplinary, you know, kind of school of thought, which made me think about that, though, because I've, I've been thinking about this recently. It is sort of interesting, isn't it, that if you think of, of discipline, you know, the verb to discipline, and you think about discipline the noun, both seem fixated on the issue of control. And I think this tells us something quite insightful. We'll have to come back to that later. But that may tell us something. You know, uh, is that really what we seek with our knowledge, control? Well, therein may lie part of the problem that we face today. We're not in control. That would be the first premise of indigenous realism, that humankind believes with our marvelous technology, our techniques, our tools, that we're in control and we quite simply are not. We are not in control. We're one small part of the very complex life system on uh, this beautiful blue-green planet Earth, or what I would call, you know, unromantically Mother Earth. And um, so I, I think that needs, needs to be made clear. And finally, I, I, uh, so once you, you come to terms with uh, being, uh, you know, an undisciplined scholar and, and uh, a recovering academic, then you can, then what you can do is you feel this sense of liberation. I just overwhelmed, oh man, that burden slipped off my shoulders. And so, but you have to have some sort of guidepost. I can't prescribe any 12-step program for recovering academics, but what I can do is share a, a story. And I, to me, I've heard the attribution given to Mark Twain. Of course, Mark Twain said everything that was, you know, very insightful and, and uh, so he may have said it, but I first heard the attribution given to Satchel Paige, and it goes like this. And this is sort of my guidepost for the work I've been doing, certainly the last decade with Native nations in North America and now in Pacific Islands and, and South America. And that would be the following. Satchel Paige was asked one time by a young ball player what advice he had. And Satchel Paige said, said uh, son, here's the best advice I can give you. Remember, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. <laughs> and so I've been now for the past decade trying to throw out any disciplinary comfortable knowledge that I had and really critically look at where are the overlaps, the convergences, the interesting twists and turns we find in, in, in the world today. And so um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm going to try... Um, uh, to make a point. Uh, I'm not gonna attest to what level of power I possess, but I am gonna try to make a point, and the point will revolve around this. Indigenous realism. I've invoked this term recently because I am tired of the trivialization of American Indian intellectual traditions as being summed up, we love Indians because you're so close to nature. Um, I find that quite insulting, actually. Because, uh, you know, people that are close to nature often seem to think that close to nature means you have to take a hike through a national park or go to the Grand Canyon or go someplace other than the Dartmouth campus. I would argue the cornerstone of indigenous realism is finding and reenacting in our own lives every day an acknowledgement that who we are as human beings is always bound up in something I call the nature culture nexus, the symbiotic relationship between humankind and the environments that we are part of. Now, what's the issue today? 
indigenous realism would describe the, one of the primary uh, sources of the situation we find ourselves in today as the following. Look at where we're sitting. Now, I'm, this is where it gets complicated because I, if I'm not careful, people will say, oh, gee, that Dan Wildcat, he's some sort of anti-technology indigenous Luddite. Quite the contrary. I just turned my smartphone off. The droid is sitting over there. It's, 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 I turned it off, okay? Um, uh, but I use that like everyone else, and I'm glad I have a laptop, and I'm glad, as I'm sure uh, Colin and Bruce recall, I remember when cut and paste really was cut and paste on master's theses and, and the like. Uh, you don't want to go back to that, students, I guarantee you. It, it was quite painful. Um, but what do I mean? I think indigenous realism is essentially an attempt to restate something that fortunately we still have people on the planet who recognize. And, and this is what they recognize. They recognize that for everyone in this room, I don't care, I don't care where your nation state heritage resides, but in your collective heritage is who you are as a person. Your family's histories reside much longer in tribal context than they do in modern nation state context. Your peoples were members of tribes for centuries longer than they were members of modern citizens of nation states. Why don't we value that? Why don't we acknowledge that? Well, because we unfortunately have this whole educational edifice, philosophy, notions of culture, notions of civilization, notions of history, which dissuade us from ever entertaining the thought that tribal peoples on the planet might have useful knowledge for people like us today. And I would argue they have some of the most important knowledge and insights of anyone on the planet. Even in the extreme duress they're facing today in the circumpolar Arctic or in, you know, the Equatorian and Brazilian uh, forest and rainforest or in Central Asia or in Africa. I would argue for an unromantic reappraisal of what I would call the inextricable linkage between the biological and ecological diversity of the planet and the human cultural diversity on the planet. We must disabuse ourselves of separating nature and culture because it is one of the most fundamentally miseducative dichotomies we have in the Western tradition. It's useful at some things, although it increasingly scientists tell us is much more complicated than we thought when we try to make the distinction between nature and culture. But you can teach any, any grade school children, well, usually they don't get it in grade school, and according to Kansas law when I was uh, 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 way back many years ago in middle school and high school. I think the first geography course I had to take was in seventh grade. And I remember one of the things we did when we were studying the geography of America, we started talking about American Indians. And we talked about, you know, the Wabanaki Confederation, the Penobscots, the Passamaquoddies. We talked of New England. We talked about the Seminoles of Florida. We talked about the Cherokees of North Carolina and Georgia. We talked about those Comanches of the Southern Great Plains. We talked about the White Mountain Apache and the Pueblos of the Southwest. And we looked at their buildings, their food, and their clothing. And we could identify who those people were by their culture throughout the lion's share of conscious human existence, our human cultures were emergent out of the landscapes and seascapes we called home. Our peoples, capital P, called home. 
we have somehow now, with the Industrial Revolution, it probably occurred earlier, I leave that to historians to worry about the periodization of history of when these things actually happened and fixing a date on it. I'm not going to worry about that. But what we have certainly seen is a drift towards a sort of notion that somehow there's a best practice, a best cultural way of doing anything and everything on the planet. And we've adopted, as it were, in this new global economy, a sort of one-size-fits-all cultural solution, or we look for those to all problems. Of course, this elides very carefully and closely with the notion of a universal history and universal truths for humankind. I mean, it fits. That's what we want, universal declarations. But I think therein lies the rub. I think as we've tried to make everyone live the same way, that comes at a very high cost to the planet. As my friend Bob Goff used to say, well, it's great. Yeah, I mean, everyone wants to be like Americans. The only problem is we'd need two more planets to have the resources we would need if everyone was going to live the way Americans did. That's, uh, you know, I, that's, that's kind of, that, that raises the question. Okay, so now what's the alternative? The alternative, I think, would be to begin a radical research regime with ecologists, with biologists, with architects, with designers, with engineers, with, you know, management people, leadership people across every school in the university where we would start looking at what kind of wisdom and insight resided in people being able to live in landscapes that most would look at today and say, oh my God, how could anyone live out there? They did. They didn't live without pain. They didn't live without discomfort. But again, maybe this is again part of the modern situation we find ourselves in. I guess some people ascribe to the notion that we shouldn't live without pain. We shouldn't live without suffering. Now, this sounds really, you know, people are going, well, golly, are you arguing for pain and suffering? No, I'm not. I'm arguing for realism. I'm <coughs> arguing for the fact that life in this world is about relationships we establish with other human beings, we establish with other species we share the planet, with the earth, with the water, with the air. And guess what? Relationships take work. I mean, it's pretty hard to build good, meaningful, respectful relationships with others of our own species. Forget thinking about other than human members of the ecosystems and environments we share the planet with. Well, I would argue there is nothing romantic at all in the notion that we should move, particularly, I think, in environmental science, natural resources, and probably economics, from a discussion based on our use of natural resources to instead a discussion about our relationship with relatives. In that way, we're quite consistent with modern evolution. There's no rub. These other life forms and species are relatives, distant relatives. But there's an advantage in that. You don't treat relatives like resources, at least not in my family. If the only time you come around is when you want to treat your aunt or uncle or your parents like a, a human ATM machine, you're going to get put in your place real quick. Why? It's disrespectful. Have we taken any other view of nature other than the ATM machine where we've constantly taken large withdrawals and when we've put stuff back, it hasn't necessarily been good for the life systems we drew 
trees, plants, water, minerals, and other animals from. I don't think that's romantic at all. I call that indigenous realism. And so I'm, I'm, I'm as Abigail said, um, you have to be careful when you talk about these topics because it is, it, it is easy to, to, to have someone take one small piece of what you say and then take it out of context. That happens to everyone. It also is, is real easy to overwhelm people with a sense of how bad it is. Because it's bad. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong now. And, and I'm not from this area, and I've only uh, spent time in uh, mountains and forested areas, you know, for brief periods of my time, you know, for months, several months at a time. But I'll tell you what. I was shocked yesterday, I'm going to tell you. I was shocked yesterday when I got the very nice ride with a driver from the Manchester airport to Hanover because I thought, my God, people here are living in a tinderbox. Am I right? Close. close. Very close. Very close. And I think that anyone who wants to suggest, you know, that somehow this isn't a major issue and something we need to look at and probably figure out very quickly some invading, uh, some, some fairly innovative ways of, of dealing with this, the, the issue. And again, now, again, we're great at this. We, we see the issue when it hits crisis mode, but we very seldom look at it from a distance with any circumspection. So I had got invited to the intertribal water uh, uh, meeting, intertribal water meeting in um, uh, New Mexico about three months ago and gave a keynote, and the guy introduced me to the, the state hydrologist for Texas. And I said, hey, I want to ask you something. I said, you know, I've been looking at all the projections about the drawdown on the Ogallala Aquifer, and I'm looking at the panhandle in Oklahoma, and I'm looking at the panhandle of Texas, and I'm going like, these guys aren't going to be doing, you know, that pivot rotation of the aquifer much longer. And I, sa I said, what do you give them? He said, well, it depends on where you're at because the aquifer, you know, isn't the same depth every place you go. Some places it's rather shallow, some places it's deep. So it depends. Uh, but he said, there are places probably where in 10 years they're not going to be able to, to irrigate that way. He said, at best, even with the best conservation, we were talking very specifically about Texas. He said probably 20, 25 years if they really instigate, you know, some creative cropping methods and, and uh, conservation. And I said, okay, and now here's the real question I want to ask you. So are, are they getting ready for this? Are they, are they planning? Are they looking at changing? He said, no. He says they won't until it's gone. He said, they won't until it's gone. This is what they know. This is what they do. And, you know, their view is, you know, well, you know, we, we don't have time to try this or that. You know, we're in the belly of the beast. We got it, you know, we take that large loan out from the bank, and we've got some high, you know, we've got some payments that, got, that have to be made, and they're tied up. And he says, they won't until they have to. So I think we've got a couple of things, very specific things I'd like to, to discuss that would be useful for us to employ that I think have worked well as, and, and again, I'll be clear about this. I think these are, 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 are essentially, at some level, we, we are talking about a fundamental, an attempt to sort of shift a, a worldview away about in which we think about ourselves, our human selves, and the balance of non-human life we share the planet with. At some level, some people might say, oh, well, you're talking metaphysics or philosophy. I, maybe, but I think these have practical consequences, very practical consequences, okay? Like I said, you, you tell me, would the way humankind, if we took seriously, if overnight we said, you know, okay, I'm, I'm not going to treat water or the earth 
or even air, or this forest is a resource, resource anymore, I'm going to see if I can establish a relationship as relatives. Would we continue to live the way we do? I'd argue it would be very difficult to do so. It would be very difficult to do so because quite frankly, we don't pay attention. And again, we tend to look constantly at ourselves in the mirror. Not literally, but in a beautiful space like this. Now, I'm not, again, people are going to say, oh, this guy's a Luddite, he wants us to take... No, I, I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying that is, 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 though, is that living, spending our times in spaces like this explains to a large extent why most Americans don't know climate change. They don't know it. Now, there's another issue running that, that's underlying this when we start talking about the general public's distrust of scientists. That's a deeper, I, you know, I'm not going to have time to address that today, nor would I try. I don't know that I've got the insight on that. I just will say this. We do seem to have a very strong anti-intellectual tradition in America. That's been kind of a part of American history, that there is an anti-intellectual, kind of popular anti-intellectualism. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, uh, are distrustful of scientists, you know, because, you know, they're just not real people. They don't really work. And they don't know the world, you know. I bet they couldn't even change the oil in their car. I know people that think exactly like that. You know, oh, you're going to trust them? How do they get their knowledge? What do they know about the world? Well, you know, this is a problem. And I think, to go back to the environment, I would make the argument that it is quite plausible that most Americans have a very difficult time understanding climate change because if I'm to believe what some recent uh, demographic reports have shaped is that for the college-age students here, it's quite likely that in their work-life careers, they will move four or five times to different places. It's hard to establish a benchmark about climate in a place if you only lived there five or ten years at a time compared to what? That's the first problem. What's the second problem? Second problem is hard to know anything about climate when all you pay attention to is the weather because you want to know if you have to grab your umbrella or your raincoat as you run from this space to your car to run into another space that's just like this. And if that's where you spend the lion's share of your time, why should you know anything about climate outside these walls? I'm arguing quite fundamentally people are experientially ignorant. It is incapable for them to wrap their minds around climate. They have no benchmark. If you're constantly moving, and climates are geographically specific, then people have no, no, again, benchmark. Again, what's the advantage for tribal peoples, indigenous peoples who've lived in places over intergeneration, multi-generations, transferring intergenerational knowledge about their relationship to that place? They can give you a benchmark for climate change. And so, what I think we need to do today, and this would be a great benefit to everyone, is, and, and I've been saying this for about three or four years uh, as a result of the work I've done with the American Indian Alaska Native Climate Change Working Group, I think what we need to do is get the best and brightest of NOAA and NASA remote sensors, the people who are doing the satellite imaging of the planet, and we need to put the kinds of powerful images that they can document of what they see big picture but we need to complement that with the local sensors, with indigenous people who live on the ground and can tell you what they're seeing, where they live, and how their world is being turned upside down. That's why I'm so glad about John Topping's new uh, 
attempt to get the uh, Arctic Climate Action Registry in place because uh, John's working on a project to get uh, villages, circumpolar peoples, uh, uh, nation states that claim, you know, uh, lands uh, within the circumpolar Arctic, uh, uh, villages, organizations to start registering and, and putting up the information about what's going on with the sea ice, with the glaciers, with the snow, with the fish, where they live, because I think this is critical. People need to see this, and most people don't. So, you know, we've got some monumental challenges. The advantage, again, I would argue, and let me give some practical examples, the advantage, I would argue, of, of sort of re-examining um, indigenous life ways, kind of throwing off the, the very, I think, um, anthropocentric gaze, which defines anthropology, and, and reframing that where we would have, you know, environmental science ecologists and maybe anthropologists or people who do cultural studies working together. Because again, I think this is the key. If we continue to think that we, there's one best way of living on the planet and everyone has to do that, I think we're headed for very, a very serious crisis. What we need to do is to restore and environmental, ecological, and biological diversity that's marked this planet's history with human cultural diversity so that we don't all live the same way. We don't all have the same diets. We don't all dress the same way. I'd say there's tremendous wisdom in that because I think that will be the key to sustainability. Now, I'm speaking to the church choir, I know, because many of you buy local eat local, you know, absolutely, absolutely. The more we can do that, the better off we will be, okay? There's always going to be planetary cultural diffusion. My people were wearing uh, uh, ribbon shirts, you know, by the, by the end of the 1700s. We had already been engaged in trade, so, you know, we were wearing cloth shirts, using ribbons to decorate them, it's, you know. Uh, very, very much uh, a part of trade I item among the Zoyaha or the Yuchi, my people. So it's, um, you know, I, th I think very quickly, three points. The first one I've already stated. I think we would do well to establish, uh, work on a discourse where we start thinking about the economic and particularly the environmental systems that we work within as systems of, of life systems of relationships and relatives rather than resources. It'll get us away from this notion that, you know, they're sort of they're there for us to use. No, we need to think about, you know, not only what we get out of it, but what's the impact on the forest, the lake, the ocean where we took that other life that we benefit from. I don't think that's romantic. I think it's modern ecology. Those processes, those relationships, understanding that. I think the most difficult thing, and I just finished a meeting where uh, Tom Goldtooth of the Indigenous Environmental Network uh, called me right before Christmas and for three days last week, the week before last, we uh, met at Haskell Indian Nations University and invited people from the Pacific Islands, from the circumpolar north, and from South America to come and continue this discussion, which actually is really, is really getting a lot of attention among philosophers and uh, ethicists, and that is, uh, what does it mean when people start invoking the rights of nature and rights of Mother Earth? And we had a three-day convening, uh, very, very difficult discussions, and um, uh, I, I mean this genuinely, it was a good meeting, but I don't think we know what that means yet. Or we know what it means in some sense, but then the question is, so what in the institutions we move in and out of? You know, how do you construct or envision policy and human behavior and activity, and particularly social activity, that would 
affirm rights of life systems as opposed to persons and how do you do it with people who one of the most deeply ingrained notions in their own worldviews is that they don't know what private property is nor do they want to affirm it. I mean I think that's an incredible challenge. It's going to be a tough one. Again, why would I be hopeful about going down that road? Because I just recently found out there are some people, there are probably some here at Dartmouth, no doubt, ecological economists who are now talking about the measure of what we call forest services. What does a forest produce that is useful, quite independent of the board feet of lumber that's manufactured out of it? We're getting close. See, there might be more value in the forest than just the trees that we can take out of it. But that's looking at a life system. That's looking at a life system. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, what does this mean? The general consensus, well, I won't say, the majority of the meeting at Rights of Mother Earth basically walked away and saying, I think maybe we ought to forget rights and let's talk about responsibilities. Of course, if you read my last book, Red Alert, I very explicitly argue that it's not an either-or proposition, but definitely we must have. If we're going to acknowledge inalienable rights of humankind, then I think we must also acknowledge inalienable responsibilities. And in my traditions, among my people, we very... I don't know that we ever talk about rights, but we talk very early on about inalienable responsibilities, what it means to be a good Zoyaha, a good Yuchi. It means being a good relative. If you don't have relatives, you're the poorest person on the planet. That's an interesting way of thinking about wealth, isn't it? We measure wealth by resources, how big your car is, how nice your home is. There are people on the planet who still measure wealth in terms of the number of good relationships you maintain. You're wealthy if you have good relatives. I would argue we extend that kind of thinking to the ecosystems and the natural environments that we're a part of. This also relieves us of something else, too. We don't have to worry about saving the planet. Now, see, I, I did that that title, Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge, which sounds like one of the most hubris-ridden claims you could ever make. Oh, we're going to save the planet with indigenous knowledge. But what I explain in the book, indigenous knowledge systems are just exactly this. They are not human-centered, strictly speaking, knowledge systems. They're knowledge systems that are born of the fact that if you pay attention to the other life you share this planet with, you may learn, in fact, how to be a better human being. We literally view, in many tribal traditions, plants. We have songs. We have prayers. Songs, plants, animals. Uh, we have ceremonies about plants, about animals, that reaffirm relationships that we have. So when the sea shepherds were up in arms about the macaw reinstituting their whaling practice after, what, a 60, 60 years, at least 60 years, you know, of uh, being in abeyance. The sea shepherds could not understand that the macaw were arguing, we're not advocating everyone should now hunt whales. What we are telling you is who we are was built out of a relationship with that animal, our relative, and we can no longer be macaw if we can no longer have that relationship with that whale. We've lost something. I don't think that's a primitive idea. I think it might be useful. We shouldn't all be hunting whales. So we've, we've, we've got this opportunity to balance inalienable rights with inalienable responsibilities. We've got the opportunity to move from resources to relatives. And then at a societal level, I think this is the real problem we have right now. We're so fixated on how we're going to reproduce existing systems. That's the crisis in education. It's a crisis in the economy. It's a crisis in our political. How are we going to reproduce? I, I think you should forget about reproduction. If they're broken, don't try to fix them. 
What is it? If they're not broken, you know, don't fix them. Well, I think we're looking at the obverse, you know, that they're broken, and I don't think you should be trying to fix them. I think what we've got to do is get some of the best and brightest young people in this room to be that generation that is going to help us reimagine, re-envision a future where humans can live resiliently. Not close to nature in the abstract, but on particular landscapes and seascapes they choose to call home. Now there's an advantage to this. See, I, uh, I'm always going to, see people ask me, well, why are you hopeful? And I'm hopeful because it's not all about us. See the tremendous relief of that? It's not all about us. Pay attention. Pay attention. And I would argue that anyone who is living currently in what looks to me like, unfortunately, a, a potentially dangerous tinderbox in this forest, Dartmouth and Hanover surrounded in, I, I, I think, you know, that um, we ought to think about very seriously. The highfalutin term would be to mitigate. Well, what are we going to do at this point? Well, there's a lot of fuel on the forest floor. And, um, you know, I have crazy ideas like this all the time because John and, and uh, Chris Phillip, one of his colleagues, and, and I were working on a little video thing we we're doing on the uh, 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 Arctic uh, Climate Action uh, Registry. And, and uh, I was thinking, you know, you know, we have AmeriCorps, we used to have VISTA workers, we had all these kind of community programs for youth. You know, what I would do is I would uh, create um, uh, ecology and environmental science programs where I would take young people out to help remove some of the fuel on the forest floor, maybe do some select cutting and things. Well, it would be work. They'd break a sweat, too. But they would learn something quite valuable about the place they live and think about that very explicitly because it would no longer be an abstraction and it would be something they would have built a relationship with. That to me is what indigenous realism is. So we move from, syst from systems of reproduction to creating systems of resilience. And here's what I feel, I'm going to close with this statement and then I'd love to hear, hear questions and, and comments. Um, I've been invited in the last year to meetings on water security, food security, environmental security, agricultural sec security, and everyone's afraid. We even have a, a new program post 9-11, Homeland Security. We live in largely a culture of fear. People are all concerned about their security. I have another suggestion. I think what we should attempt to do as we move from resources to relatives, as we move from rights to responsibilities, as we move from discussions about reproduction to discussions about systemic societal and ecological resilience, I think what we should do is move towards models of homeland maturity. What we have is a lack of homeland maturity in the United States. People live in suburbs, they have mailing addresses, they have street addresses, but most of America is sadly homeless. They have no real sense of place. Often they don't even know their neighbors, or if they do, they say hi, but. Do they ever eat together? Do they socialize together? Do they go to ceremonies together? I mean, other than the football stadium. <laughs> we do have a ceremonial life in, in uh, uh, you know, colleges and universities. People are hungry for that. I don't think that's indigenous romanticism. I think it's about how can we work to envision, to enact systems of life enhancement. Not just for ourselves, but for the entire life we share particular landscapes and seascapes with. I think that's what we desperately need. 
I think we've got programs at Dartmouth, at Haskell Indian Nations University, at Little Bighorn College, at Sinteglaska University, at Harvard, at Yale, at Diné College, at Salish Kootenai College, at Northwest Indian College. We have people who are ready to tackle these kinds of things. But it's going to be difficult work. It's going to be very difficult work because the institutions that we are, we live in and we work in are not necessarily built to accommodate this cross-disciplinary fertilization, this cross-disciplinary activity. And some have very vested interest in reproducing the current system we have. It's going to be hard work. Don't think it isn't. But keep your goals modest and be humble. And just remember, you don't have to do it all. We still have relatives on the planet and places on the planet that can teach us about how to be competent human beings. Thank you very much. Love to have, love to have questions or comments. I, I mean, um, you know, a typical response I get is, is people didn't understand anything I said, and they just kind of looked there blank, or else this would be the first time I was so clear. No one has a question. I don't think either. I hope neither one of those is the case. But any, anyways, questions, comments, please. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to check when you said. Oh, oh yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I was. Uh, I just wanted to check about when you said this is a tinderbox. Yeah. And then you started to talk about the forest floor. I wanted to make sure that my understanding was correct, that you were actually talking about the physical fire danger at the moment, or were you talking about something larger? Oh, no. I, I was, well, again, uh, uh, I, Abigail said, and I'm a horrible salesperson. Everyone's always said, "Did you bring some books?" I never think about bringing books anyway. You read my, you read my book, Red Alert. I have a chapter in there where I have a whole section called um, uh, Global Burning. I, I do think, in one sense, it's more accurate to suggest that we are currently burning up the planet than simply warming it. But what I was talking about was just specifically what I saw as the sort of uh, drought-related stress you can see in the trees. Uh, and again, I'm not a forest person, so to me this was very startling because even someone like me and driving from Manchester here and, and then looking at, you know, the number of, of trees with obvious wilt, obviously des very dry, you know, kind of green but with little, the little fringes, you know, of of red and discoloration from, from, from lack of water and then looking at then the floor of what I could see under those trees, the number of dead trees, what foresters would call fuel, uh, I got to thinking this does not look good. This looks very, very dangerous and I was asking uh, Bruce about it today and, and, and uh, Ross and both told me that yeah, they're, you guys have already been in what, some sort of red alert mode for outdoor burning and that kind of thing. And I'd say that's very wise. So I was literally talking about the condition of the forest. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned the word reproduction, and, mm -hmm. and I thought of that in another aspect. Okay. It, it, when, when you and I are kids, there are well over 100 million fewer people on, mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. and several billion fewer people than on the earth. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot less pavement, a lot less urbanization than mm -hmm. there is now. Mm -hmm. Does that, but I'd like to see your comments on that in terms of it being the relative difficulty of back then to now to, mm -hmm. to address the problems you brought up. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, we can think about, and, and I was thinking about that in terms of, of existing institutions and systems that we move in, but I think just the issue of human population is, is a major issue. I would link both of those together because I think, you know, I, and someone here will know the numbers better than I am. But currently, if, if we look at uh, what, there was a marvelous piece done by an uh, economist uh, who worked with uh, 
grain scientist out of the University of Michigan. I know someone in this room probably can cite the, the report and the study, but looking at what is it going to take for us to feed a human population that by, you know, uh, 2050, maybe 11, 12 billion people. How, how do, first of all, do we have the land to do it? And what he said is, is first of all, maybe uh, it would mean, but, but the big thing is we cannot afford to tear down any more forest for farmland. That's going to be an incredible impact on the life system of this planet. We can't do that. So he said we've got to really look at how can we take existing unproductive lands and make those more productive, but how do we do that without the dependency we currently have on sort of, you know, carbon-based fertilizers and, and that kind of thing. So I, I think, you know, absolutely those, those things are related, and I think that, um, you know, uh, again, a hopeful side of this would be that, um, of course, you guys have all seen the studies, but in, in most of the industrial countries of the world, you know, we, we do have um, uh, uh, declines in, in fertility, uh, declines in birth rate, but yet we still have places in the world where that is going up, too. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's complex, and that's why I think, you know, if we're going to talk about human population, we have to talk about food, we have to talk about water. Oh, by the way, that report said the most pressing issue would obviously be water. Water is going to be, I was telling this young man, I'm sorry, I forget his name, but one of our Native American students I met last night, he's serving as an intern with John Topping and the Climate Institute, and I said, well, what are you studying? And he said, water resources. I said, good choice, good choice. Because I think this will be the century where water is going to be the, this, this reality that is going to really get people's attention. Some people are going to have a lot more of it than they ever wanted, and some people are going to have a lot less of it. And, uh, you know, when, so when we think about human population, development, urban, suburban kind of expansion or agricultural, you know, area expansion, this becomes very difficult because those two are indeed very much related. So we've got to get a handle on how we're going to address that. I didn't say these are easy problems. I think they're very, very difficult problems, but I think we've reached the point to where, you know, we're ready for some very difficult discussions. And um, I think it, it would be good, you know, if I were going to have a, a meeting here and, and discuss, um, you know, the issue of, of uh, wildlife ecology, you know, I'd, I'd want as my keynote speaker Billy Frank, the legendary leader of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Or I would ask the Lakota elder Albert Whitehat. Why? Because when they talk about fish and Albert talks about the migratory bird path that goes over the Re Rosebud Sioux Reservation, they don't talk about resources, they talk about relatives. And it totally changes the tone of how you approach the issue. So, Good question. I, 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 I do see those two as related, and so when I think of reproduction, I was thinking about the systemic, but the human population thing is, is right there in front of us, and it is, it's going to be a very exacerbating kind of force in all of these you know, issues we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. Um, where do you think American anti-intellectualism came from, and where do you think it's going to go? You know, I think there, there's probably, um, this is interesting, because I've, I've, I've sort of, of thought about that a lot, and, um, you know, Colin, you might have an opinion about this. I, I'd say there are, two, there are a couple of sources I w that I would see, and I would say in, in one, I think... Um, sort of from the English and Protestant side of, of European immigration, I, I think um, uh, Luther's principles of sola vitae, sola scriptura are, 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 if you have a religious tradition 
that is based on the notion that all one needs is scripture and all one needs is faith, sola scriptura, sola fide, then I think that leads to sort of a distrust of sort of meddling around in things that you shouldn't, like evolution, you know, like, you know, bioengineering, like different, different things that, that people would argue, you know, this, this is a problem. So I, I would say that's at least one potential, you know, uh, uh, sort of cultural source. The other one I would sort of argue, interestingly enough, and, and again, I've thought about, and I'm, I have very specific view of this in terms of, I think, again, something that might resonate with this audience in this place. I think if you go back and you look at the development of intellectual life in the 19th century, what I find interesting about is the most important people of that early period, I'd say probably the first at least 30, 40, 50 years is probably pushing it, but were the New England Transcendentalists. Now, no one reads them anymore. No one reads. I mean, if you're going to get a degree in philosophy, you're never going to read the New England Transcendentalists because they weren't systematic, they weren't empirical. But if you look at what they were talking about, and, and again, why am I talking about them and anti-intellectualism? They gave a sort of an intellectual expression to what I think the common man took and then took a totally different way, you know, the un-Harvard educated, the un-Boston, you know, um, Bostonian civilized American. And that is, you know, they wanted to create a truly American body of thought and philosophy and aesthetics, you know, and prided themselves on separating themselves from Europe. Certainly Thoreau spoke very specifically about that. He, had no use for European philosophy and aesthetics. He wanted to learn what the land here could teach him. And I think in an odd sort of way for many Americans, they took, uh, they took that, that same kind of resentment of we're going to do something here differently as this sort of ragged kind of, um, excuse me, cowboy kind of mentality of, you know, uh, just too much thinking around here. We're men of action. We're women of action. We just get things done. And there are some valuable sides of that, but it also feeds a sort of anti-intellectualism. You know, those who do, do. Those who can't, teach. I'd say that's pretty anti-intellectual. Teachers are people who just can't do anything. We have to find some place to put these poor souls. So I would argue it's twofold. I think there's sort of a, maybe a, a particular kind of, um, you know, the extreme forms would be in a, a Calvinistic kind of Protestantism or maybe a Puritanical kind of tradition, which is suspicious of people who are always trying to be creative and innovative. Um, that was quite interesting. Did anyone see, what was the movie that was made about the guy who was the real Shakespeare, ghost writing, and, and his wife's whole complaint? Anyone see that? What was the name of that movie? Anonymous. Yeah, Anonymous. Anonymous. And you looked at that, and, and it portrays this poor guy who was actually Shakespeare writing, and his wife is just fit to be tied. Can't you do anything but write? <laughs> My wife says the same thing to me. You know, uh, could you ever put down the book, you know, please? And, and so, you know, I think, there's a, I think there are palpable sources of anti-intellectual. That would be my short answer. Colin, what do you think about that? Yeah, the notion of the frontier, that, that's kind of an interesting too. You know, men on the frontier don't have time to think. You're men and women of action. Yeah. Here and then back to women here. But Although you've been very careful to uh, minimize the romanticism yes, that uh -huh. uh, is, is possible always mm -hmm. here, um, I, I wonder if you would talk to the issue of 
the sort of the dark side of tribal mm -hmm. uh, consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, one could argue that the history of humankind mm -hmm. has been one of one tribe against another, mm -hmm. one difference cited mm -hmm. to destroy mm -hmm. the other. Mm -hmm. And we see this playing out in Hutus and Tutsis and mm -hmm. Protestants mm -hmm. and Catholics, and you could mm -hmm. go on and on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, given that we are mm -hmm. biologically wired to identify differences mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. capably, mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you promote a world in which you sort of let go a little bit of that tribalism in order to cooperate and uh, do, as you say, uh, work uh, you know, in a spirit of community with our environment? Well, I'd argue, again, that's, that's where myth hits reality. I'd argue that anyone who thinks, you know. So I would ask you, what are the defining communitarian features of American society? What is it that all Americans share? And, and I, I would argue, there you go, individualistic greed. My win is your loss. That's not real good for building community. And so I, I, I think, you know, again, you know, for the sake of argument, I would argue it seems to me if we were going to, to, you know, this is the dark side of this whole discussion. And again, I, and I'm being clear about why I disagree with it. But there would be certain kind of evolutionary biologists, sociobiologists who would argue, uh, some of the popularizers of Darwinian versions of evolutionary theory who would argue, hey, buddy, you are romantic. We are hardwired for competition and aggression. Welcome to the real world. And I would simply point out that it seems to me the counterpoint to that is, is that we have, if we have environments where we can be freed of the pressures of scarcity, we can find peoples on the planet who have lived for hundreds of years without killing themselves. They, we will always have human violence. We will always have that. But I'd argue, I don't know if tribal level violence, uh, which is worse, a modern nation state with enough thermonuclear warheads to destroy the entire planet or tribal peoples that are fighting over a stream or a lake? I have thought about this. Now, I'm glad Colin's here because this is just the perfect time to say this statement and he can correct me. It seems like civilized societies have, have the distinction of doing something, though, even the most primitive tribal societies have never engaged in. As far as I know, I, um, I'm waiting to be create, created. No one's ever challenged me on this, so I, if you can give me an example, I'd love to hear it. The Pawnee, I've got cousins who are my dad's oldest brother. My Uncle Jimmy married a... a an echo hawk, a Pawnee woman. So I've got all these cousins that are, you know, half Pawnee and Yuchi. And um, uh, the Pawnee were notorious on, on the plains for stealing horses, you know, of course, only beat out by the Comanche. And, and the Comanche, and, and they prided themselves on this. They loved stealing horses, you know. Uh, uh, and when people stepped on their territories, they would defend them. There was war. There was plenty of, count of examples of intertribal war. I don't know before the point of contact with European colonizers, though, whether American Indians could ever have claimed to have conducted a religious war against another people because of their religion. It takes civilizations to do that. And if I can be tribal and avoid religious wars, I would choose tribalism. Now, tribalism also has this downside, though. I, I will tell you right now, I have colleagues who are, you know, if they see this film, are going to be cringing every time I invoke tribe or tribalism because they'd say, Dan, you're, that term is too value-laden. You shouldn't use it. But I think, I think again, I'm, I'm going to take the position that, well, no, that's been the received view of the people who wrote our histories and who we were engaged in this history of 
colonialism with and who, you know, and, and, and I would argue that maybe there are valuable features of tribalism. It's not perfect. But I do think right now it's dangerous to talk about, you know, promoting tribalism when if you look at the way the media treats tribalism, it is almost always uh, in the, the sense that tribalism equates. In fact, there was something in this 50-page paper I was working on, and if I can find it, I want to quote it because I was thinking about this just a couple of weeks ago, and, and I came across this, and it is worth quoting if I can find it very, very quickly. Okay. Um, and I probably won't be able to. But it really does, oh, here it is right now. So I'm going to, you know, I'll end with this just because I think it's provocative and it speaks directly to your question. First, the problem with invoking the idea of anything tribal or the concept of tribalism is that this word is mired in a long history of Western ideas of sociocultural evolution by way of social Darwinist thinkers, thinkers of the 19th century. To call oneself a tribal person seems to invoke automatically savagery, barbarism, ignorance, and or, there's the other extreme, a romantic close to nature, you know, attitude. Um, uh, but I would argue this notion of tribalism is hardly an issue of past social science history. Its miseducative function is almost daily evident in its prejudicial use of the term in the reporting on the geo geopolitical conflicts unfolding in Africa, Latin America, and especially now in the Middle East and Central Asia. One only need to examine New York Times op-ed columnist, columnist Thomas Friedman's March 24, 2012 editorial, A Festival of Lies, where he favorably quotes the concluding paragraph of classicist and historian Victor Davis, Davis Hansen's National Review online piece entitled, We Give Up. And I quote, this is verbatim from um, uh, Victor Davis Hansen's National Review piece. What have we learned? Tribalism, oil, Islamic fundamentalism are a bad mix that leaves Americans sick and tired of the Middle East, both when they get in it and when they try to stay out of it. I thought it was real interesting that in that mix of Islamic fundamentalism and oil, he had to throw in tribalism. But I think this is, again, part of this baggage we carry. So when I think of myself as a tribal member of the people called Zoyaha, those people from a distance, I don't think of myself as savage. I don't think of myself as, as, barian, as barbarian. But I probably don't think of myself as civilized either. I think I'm going to do what Dr. Henrietta Mann did. It's always good to quote people. Dr. Henrietta Mann gave a speech. She's a Southern Cheyenne woman who spent most of her adult life living with the Northern Cheyenne, one of our great scholars, indigenous scholars. And, and Henrietta Mann, I had her as a guest faculty me member at Haskell in the 94-95 academic year. The first time around when I was chair of, at that time, we called the Department of Natural and Social Sciences. And I heard her giving a lecture. My office is right next door. And she said, she says, you know, you have to understand something. She says, you know, we're different in terms of how we think about religion and spirituality. She said, remember, in, among my people, day one, the moment of creation, we acknowledge we are spiritual beings. The struggle we have is how do we become competent human beings. I think I'm just like the rest of you. I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a competent human being on this planet. I don't have all the answers. I need some of you to help me. Everyone in here has some useful knowledge. If we had the time, that could teach me something that would make me a better human being. And, um, you know, so 
we got to find spaces and places to have these kinds of discussions where we don't worry about the clock. And uh, I invite all of you to come to the next American Indian Alaska Native Climate Change Working Group meeting where we will convene in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I think it's going to be the, the very, it, it's, uh, I think ACES or SACNAS starts the first, second, and third, and I think what we're talking about is piggybacking on that, and somewhere in that first week of November, we're going we're gonna to convene the Tribal College Center, Centered Network I talked about. Uh, and uh, I would very much like to have, you know, Dartmouth students and Eigert students and NAS students come out and join us because I think we've got some good work we can do. None of us have all of the answers, okay? So we need, we need to have some difficult discussions, and I think they will be difficult. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah.